if you are sitting comfortably, then I will begin. So the word of the Buddha, but I'm just going to deviate again. And uh, this morning we're talking about Samatha Vipassana and why we have a group of people uh, sitting in a, a Catholic retreat centre <laughs> doing a 10 day meditation, or 8 day meditation retreat. Where does this all come from? What is the relationship between Samatha and Vipassana historically? And there's a wonderful little a uh, book review, which we found, Religious Studies Review, and it's a copyright 2018 by Rice University in the US. And it gives a very accurate uh, understanding of where Vipassana meditation arose from. And there's two little books it's reviewing. But anyway, here we go. Uh, how have we gone from the Buddha and Bodhidharma uh, to John Kabat-Zinn and Thich Nhat Hanh? This is John Kabat-Zinn, a Theravada uh, mindfulness, cognitive behavioural therapy, and uh, from Bodhidharma to Buddhism to China, and also to Korea, Japan, uh, from there, and Thich Nhat Hanh. This and much more is explained in Eric Brown's book, Born, B-R-A-U-S book, Birth of Insight and Meditation, Modern Buddhism, and the Buddhist monk, Lady Sayadaw, L-E-D-I, Sayadaw, from Burma. And he was uh, in the, the turn of the um, 1900s. Brown shows that American mindfulness is the product of two traditions of Theravada insight meditation vipassana, which trace their roots to colonial Burma. Those deriving from the Burmese monk Mahasi Sayadaw and the Indian layman uh, Goenka. But Goenka was a disciple of Ubakin, who was a disciple of Upotate, who was then in turn a disciple of Lady Sayadaw, and Mahasi Sayadaw was a disciple of Mingun Sayadaw, and the meditative teachings of who were fashioned in a sphere of lay religiosity created and pervaded by the influence of Lady Sayadaw. The origins of the mindfulness movement, East and West, are thus rooted in Lady Sayadaw and his modernizing efforts. The sort of mindfulness promoted by such organizations like the Insight Meditation Society was essentially a simplification of ladies' meditative innovations. Uh, and this is detailed in The Birth of Insight by Brown in Chapter 5. Meditation was taught by Lady Sidor was heavily influenced by the Abhidhamma scholasticism with a focus on, on insight, on knowledge, rather than meditative absorption, the jhanas or samadhi. This can be seen in all of Lady's writings on meditation. His encyclopedic manual on meditation mostly deals with the five khandhas, the five aggregates. If there's any new meditators here, this doesn't make any sense to. You can just uh, close your ears and do some, <laughs> and do some uh, quiet contemplation. But there's many here who often ask the questions, you know, where did this, you know, sometimes conflict, jhana, vipassana, whatever, where did those all come from? And anyway, the aim being to gain insight into the three marks of existence, the impermanence, uh, non-self-suffering. And his big book on meditation focuses on the material elements leading to insight into the body. And the manual of insight meditation is based on a detailed analysis of the 82 fundamental realities according to the Abhidhamma. And uh, Lady Sayadaw's most detailed account of meditation is found in his manual of breath meditation, Anapanasati. The fourfold scheme presented here includes the jhanas, 
had Lady himself, Lady Sada himself, claims of masterdom. But considering. Okay, pause. <laughs> <laughs> This is not as heavy as our one. It's actually quite comfortable. So anyway, this is um, where uh, the mindfulness tradition came from, which has been very successful in the United States. So, <coughs> Lady Sayadaw was a Burmese monk over 100 years ago. The most detailed account of meditation is found in the Manual of Breath Meditation. The fourfold scheme presented there includes the jhanas, and Lady, himself, Lady Sayadaw himself claims to have mastered them. By considering that jhana might be too difficult to be practiced by the lay followers, Lady Sayadaw followed the Visuddhi Maka in allowing a weaker form of meditative absorption instead of cultivating the jhanas proper. The meditator can thus move directly from access concentration, as Upachara Samadhi, to insight, uh, often goes straight to insight after Kanika Samadhi, momentary concentration a state prior to access concentration, attained simply through counting the breath. And Brown notes that by telling his readers that only a simple form of practice and a relative modicum uh, of calm were necessary, Lady Sayadaw opened up Vipassana to, its, to a much wider audience. A mass meditating mo meditation movement in Burma was thus born. And in line with Lady Sayadaw's instructions, further simplification were introduced by Mahasi Sayadaw and Goenka. Mahasi Sayadaw presented a practice based on the mindfulness of the breath, but jet jettisoned the lay Abhidharma study, which Lady assumed to be necessary, Lady Sayadaw. Brown notes that in Mahasi's teachings, all the bedrock conceptions of lay meditation revealed in Lady's work remain an Abhidhamma approach, a downplaying of, con of concentration practice, and, <coughs> and an emphasis on the observation of everyday reality. Goenka built, built on Ubakin's systematic, systematic, systematization, systematization. And you've got the wrong word there. Systemization of Ladies Sido's teachings into 10 day courses in presenting it in a more de Buddhistized form, in which a modicum of samatha or calm achieved through, observa achieved through observing the breath of the nostrils was followed by Vipassana in a form of scanning the body observing the rise and fall of the four material elements in the subatomic form. Uh, Brown thus shows how the practice of meditation in Burmese Theravada was resurrected through Lady Sayadaw's textualism and then simplified first by Lady Sayadaw himself and then by those influenced by him. The <coughs> Americans Please, don't I put down the Americans, but that's what they got here. 
who received this practice were unaware of these adaptions. They found they the founders of things like the Insight Meditation Society thought they were receiving an archaic technique faithfully transmitted since the time of the historic Buddha. Had Joseph Goldstein, a very good meditator, has thus claimed that what inspires me is the connection with the original teachings of the Buddha, with what, as far as we know, he actually taught during his lifetime. Similar claims had earlier been made by Goenka. The purity of the teachings was lost. In the country of Myanmar, however, it was preserved by a chain of devoted teachers. But as Brown notes, Lady Sayadaw never made such a claim, nor, nor did Tekgi or Ubaki so, put so much stress on a perfectly preserved technique. The history of meditation in Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism, is sketchy ever since scriptural learning was favoured over the practice in Sri Lanka, apparently at around the same time as the Pali Canon was written down in the 1st century BC. The Sinhalese tradition prioritised scholasticism at the expense of meditation because war and civil unrest threatened the survival of the Buddhist tradition. Sinhalese Buddhists reason that, just as a treasure trove can be identified through instructions inscribed on a stone, so too could Buddhism be preserved even in times of difficulty in a written canon, uh, if a written canon survives to pro provide the blueprint for practice. This is exactly what happened in the lifetime of Lady Sayadaw, with the Burmese fearing a loss of tradition under British colonialism. Lady Sayadaw resurrected a meditative tradition based on his impressive scriptural learning and the widespread lay practice of meditation both East and West thus depends on Lady Sayadaw's flexible and simplified version of mindfulness. The most obvious deviation from canonical teachings was the downplaying of jhanas, a key aspect of the Eightfold Path and closely connected to mindfulness in numerous canonical teachings. Just one of the things we read out here, for example, the Kaigata Sutti, Kaigata Sati Sutta, I said coming soon, for example, states that the mindfulness of the breath leads to the mind becoming internally still, composed and absorbed. It is ironic then that although uh, new Buddhist commentators have criticised the tendency to strip away key aspects of Buddhism from mindfulness, their own understanding of Buddhist spirituality is itself a modernist construct, one which um, lacks the jhanic dimension which is probably the single most important aspect of the path in the Pali discourses. It turns out the recent debate on mindfulness in America is between different versions of Buddhist-inspired mind, modern, um, sorry, <coughs> modern spiritualities. There's this more here if you're interested in uh, this, but it basically comes down to this, uh, a very powerful, very good monk in Burma around 1900, Lady Sayadaw, who actually feared the destruction of <coughs> Buddhism because of the, uh, my ancestors, your ancestors if you're English, taking over the place. And so tried to simplify sort of uh, Buddhism. And as a result, sort of, uh, we've got step by step into thinking that things like jhanas aren't really necessary and uh, what the modern mindfulness movement in so many early days there was no such thing as nine day or ten day retreats but people would go to the temple for free and join in the temple and just do the meditation there and have access to teachers sort of basically all the time so the Nine day retreats, they are a new thing, but sometimes they're very useful. But to point out that where we do get the tradition that you don't need jhanas, or as mentioned there, kanaka samadhi, or upachara samadhi, kanaka samadhi literally means that kanaka just for a moment. 
And if you do translate samadhi as concentration, then you can understand even that momentary concentration. I was concentrating for a moment, but my <laughs> teachers at school would never accept that. Concentration even would take a duration of a, a, a quite a while. But if you uh, render so the samadhi as stillness, then it becomes the oxymoron. You can't be still for a moment. And when it comes to the other, what they call, and you may hear this from other books, other teachings, the upachara samadhi, what's called neighborhood concentration, access concentration. There is such a thing called the neighborhood concentration. It happens at two times when you are meditating, either just before jhanas or just after jhanas. You enter the threshold, the doorway, the welcome mat, on the way into a house and on the way out. And the difference between those two states is that the one on the way in, you're not really sure if you're really on the welcome mat or not, because you know you don't know one more step and you're in or is it something else you're on? So upachara samadhi, as you go into a deep state of meditation, is very uncertain. And it may just slip away very easily, it's not stable. But the <coughs> upachara on the way out <coughs> is far more stable, you can in a huge meditative state. And of course, it's very easy to recognize that was something really big. And you're on the way out, and that um, type of um, stillness and clarity does last for a long time. And it's usually those are the times when you do get a big insight. Uh, recently, when I, uh, just a, a year ago, a year or two years ago, that when um, Ajahn Jayasara was completing the biography of Ajahn Chah, I managed to, he um, was very happy that I came to see him, he had some questions about you know, some of uh, my experiences with Ajahn Chah, because I was with him for nine years. <coughs> and uh, of all the monks, Western monks who were with Ajahn Chah, I think there's only one monk, Ajahn Pasana, in Canada, no, sorry, it's in San Francisco now, was with Ajahn Chah longer. Many other monks were just with him for a shorter time. So anyway, that there, I did ask even uh, Ajahn Jarasara just to confirm with all of the recorded tapes in Thai or sometimes in Mao, which he'd gone through meticulously, tirelessly, all the talks and teachings of Ajahn Chah. Where did Ajahn Chah say that one could get enlightened? And he said, well, either of the two uh, access concentrations before jhanas. But he said the one which was the most common, which Ajahn Chah praised, was the after jhana, precisely as I remembered. So this is where the Vipassana tradition came from, and it's also to be noted that the, even in Vietnam, I go to Vietnam, well, I've been to Vietnam quite a lot, and the little book which uh, I wrote about mindfulness, this and beyond, that is now required study uh, in the universities there for people becoming monks or nuns. So I am respected over there, and also because of that, they, they let me know, they told me that about, I don't know how many years ago, the United Buddhist Sangha, I think it's pre-Vietnam War, the United Buddhist Sangha of Mahayana and Theravada monks there, they made a resolution not to teach jhanas to lay people. They made that resolution. It's been overturned many years since. And I asked, why do you do that? And they said, it's just too troublesome. <laughs> <laughs> It needed too much renunciation and giving up. So <coughs> there is a reluctance which I have found in my years as a monk to teach jhanas. 
especially to the laity. And of course, being a Westerner, whenever I hear things like that, I said, that is wrong. You have to teach, as I said, without a, a closed fist, to be open to everybody, give people a chance. But you can see that teaching jhanas is so difficult. It's much easier to teach vipassana insight. And one of the reasons you'll find soon in the next couple of days that the jhanas, they really challenge sort of your ideas of life, of will, consciousness, its nature, who you are. It's challenging. And sometimes if a person does experience a full-on jhana, it will change your life. And some people are not ready, they don't want their lives to be changed. It's too troublesome. So anyway, that was just a little bit. If you want to ask some questions later on tonight, or if you want to have a read through this article, it's very, very informative about uh, the Vipassana tradition, as we have today. Vipassana is, is part of it. So but the way it's described these days is something which uh, arose in the time of Lady Sayadaw, as a way of making Buddhism more popular easy to get some meditation experiences, uh, just to preserve it. Anyway, I thought I'd just stir you up a little bit there. But anyway, now we go to, again, the uh, rise in the past and the way, the rise and fall. This is 47, page 42, sorry. And already here, I already mentioned the first one, about what it means by rise and fall. And those of you who have some experience of Vipassana retreats, you're supposed to watch Rise and Fall, never tell you what Rise and Fall really is. And it's not just things coming and going. The whole purpose of understanding Rise and Fall in Satipatthana is not to see just a process, but to understand the why of that process. And it's always, it says here, supported by the four nutriments, there's the origination and continuance of the body. The cessation of the four nutriments, the body ceases. And the nutriments, food, sense, contacts, will and consciousness is. And uh, earlier on in this translation, I always translated the word vinyana as consciousness is, because this is defined by the Buddha, six different types of consciousness. Not just one, but six different types. Totally different. If you translate it as consciousness, then people say, ah, oh, this is soul. This is the permanent essence. But the Buddha made it very clear. Six different types of consciousness, and when one is there, the others are vanish. And the next thing is the uh, experience, the origin of experience. Experience is just, you know, the sixth sense experience, a knowing, a seeing, a hearing, a, uh, a smelling, a, a tasting or a touching. So sometimes we get confused when it's con uh, translated as like pleasure or pain. Pleasure or pain is a type of experience, a classification of experience. For Vedana, literally means to experience. So what does it mean by rise and fall? You need like six sense contacts. Uh, pasta, this is where the senses turn on. There's the origination of experience. With the cessation of that contact, the experience ceases. And the jitta, the consciousness in the sense of the mind consciousness, supported by this thing called Nama Rupa. There is the origination of the jitta of consciousness. With the cessation of Nama Rupa, the chitta ceases. It doesn't just go into some uh, sleeping mode, like on your computer, it goes into sleep, just the chitta turns off. It's not there anymore. And Nama Rupa means, quite simply, the objects of consciousness. And uh, in other places, it says, it gives a simile, just like two sheaves of reeds leaning against one another. 
uh, understanding in those days it was an agrarian society, a military society. So they used many metaphors you know, from uh, armies and also farming. And to dry the sheaves of reeds or uh, rice, they would lean them up against one another to dry in the sun. And if you take one of those away, the other one falls down. So the objects of consciousness support consciousness. Without the objects of consciousness, consciousness ceases. <coughs> and lastly, just the rise and fall of dhammas or mind objects, supported by attention is the origination of mind objects. With the cessation of attention, mind objects cease. So this is saying these are not always existing. They only exist when the causes arise to make them exist. And the simile, which is elsewhere in this little book, this is from the Agha Vajragota Sutta. And this is a wanderer called Vajragota. <coughs> uh, Ask the Buddha, now when sort of an enlightened being dies, where do they go? Do they exist after death? What happens? And uh, the Buddha uh, answered with a simile of a fire. I prefer just to uh, change the simile slightly to the simile of like a candle. Uh, I think it's valid because it create, keeps the, the original meaning but makes it a tiny bit easier to understand. Uh, a candle flame depends upon three causes three nutriments, three upadanas, not attachment, but literally uptakings, fuel. And that is the, the wick, the, the, um, the oil or wax, and the heat. And if any one of those three causes expires, <coughs> such as the oil or wax is exhausted, the wick is all burnt up, <coughs> or someone takes the heat away, then the flame <coughs> just is extinguished. And the Buddha asks Vajragota, what happens to the flame? If it's been a good, well-behaved flame, <coughs> does it go to, to heaven, where all the good flames can burn happily ever after? <laughs> if it's been a bad flame, does it go to hell? He actually said, where does it go? East, west, north, south, up or down? And what you go? He went to it. It doesn't apply. It makes no sense. So it goes, it's, it's extinguished, that's all. And the Buddha said, just like the uh, five components of existence, what makes up you? The body, experience, perception, will, and consciousnesses, all six of them, including the mind. It's all cause. And when the causes stop, then the effect doesn't go anywhere. It's extinguished. And <coughs> the, the last important part of this is the word for a flame being extinguished. Is it in Ibanas? So when somebody would ask uh, the kid, hey, be careful, the flame's going out make sure it isn't Nibbāna. The kid would understand that. The word Nibbāna was a commonly used word. Just in life, the flame being extinguished. So anyway, this is why we have in the Satipatthana understanding the causes of these things. Not seeing it rise and fall, but why it comes, why it goes and to see that all of these, especially the four focuses of mindfulness, why choose these? Things like experience, it comes and goes. It's not stable. Even people who think they can go to a heaven realm and live happily ever after. Ha ha ha. That is impossible. Even Saint Augustine understood that if you go to heaven, one day a year, you have to go to hell. 
Otherwise you'd never appreciate and value heaven. You do need to have something different to know what happiness is. When he was on the money there, as they say, that if things don't change, they disappear, you take them for granted. Anyway, so and that is why, see why things come, why things go, they're always changing. And because, you know, even, would you agree to that? Would that be a nice place to retire to? You know, heaven for eternity, but one day every year you have to go to hell. Would you be looking forward to that? <laughs> so it's still unsatisfactory. Anyway, this is why you put down here what it means the rise and fall, according to how the Buddha taught. And it says, you can check it out, it's in the uh, Satipatthana, some year too, and I just um, read it out for you. The second um, uh, Satipatthana is the focus on the mindfulness of experience. And again, each one of these, it always understood that you have done the background, that you have restrained the five hindrances, that you have are you mindful, energized, and know the purpose of what you're doing? Why are you mindful of experience? Now how you do this, when feeling a pleasant experience, <coughs> you are mindful that it's a, a pleasant experience. When an unpleasant experience, you're mindful that it's an unpleasant experience. When feeling a neutral experience, you're under, a mindful that it's a neutral experience. Just like they say sometimes a long breath, a short breath, or in between breath, it gives you an idea to understand experience and especially its effective qualities of pleasant or unpleasant. Now it also says when feeling a worldly uh, pleasant experience, a worldly unpleasant experience, or so worldly uh, pleasant um, unpleasant neutral experience or an unworldly pleasant unpleasant or neutral experience. And the word, reason they, uh, the reason the Buddha here is distinguishing between a worldly pleasant experience and an unworldly pleasant experience is, I think I've already indicated, <coughs> that the unworldly pleasant experience includes things like inspiration, you know, the joys of a relaxed body, the, the happiness, the incredible happiness of deep meditations or understanding some insight in meditation, that creates enormous happiness. And the Buddha distinguishes between the two of them, the worldly and unworldly. Because the unworldly happinesses, they're safe, they should be followed and made much of. The unworldly ones, they're dangerous. So the worldly ones, they're dangerous. You get stuck and they lead to a lot of problems. So it's not all pleasure should be let go of. There are some things that you should attach to. That is the teaching of Buddha. So you have to know the difference between the two of them. And obviously the, the worldly and unworldly pleasant experience. And sometimes you know you have to uh, endure, be patient if you can't do anything about it, sometimes just being with it and just knowing it's unpleasant but it will pass. And then when you don't overreact to the unpleasant natures of the world, then just the way you use those unpleasant experiences makes it either worldly or unworldly. It's using for the benefit of yourself or other beings, just a bit of patience and endurance. And the world in neutral experiences and the unworldly neutral experiences the worldly ones are just dullness, sloth and torpor, and being sort of in a very lethargic, dull state of mind. Depression. Actually depression is pretty negative. You can't really call it um, a neutral. And the neutral, worldly, uh, unworldly experiences are just equanimity. And even there it's hard to call that a neutral experience. Because even there it's very blissful to be neutral and still. In, in part of the Kuala Upeka, equanimity, 
But the Buddha always said that that's a bliss, the happiness, the bliss of equanimity. Anyway, in this way you experience, you, you are aware of your own experiences, or you are aware of the experiences of others, is of the same nature as yours. You abide mindful of both your own and others' experience of happiness and, and pain and having experience. You're no different. Or else you abide, importantly, what causes the arising of experience. And the nature of the experience to cease, why it ceases. Or by contemplating experiences, cause and nature of both arising and ceasing. What's well, mindfulness is just experience, impermanent suffering and not self, not mind, not a permanent essence. It's established in you to the extent necessary for mindfulness and wisdom, essential to liberation. And you abide independent, not clinging to anything in the world, especially not clinging to experience. That's how a meditator abides mindful of experience, of Vedana. There was one article which I recall, which you know, opened you know, some understanding of what this means. Because I always thought that having all of your, especially five senses intact, was a wonderful gift. And there was a tale of a young boy who was uh, born deaf. And, uh, he couldn't hear anything, understand any sound. It was just not registering in his brain. And after a while, uh, every year, his parents would take him to the GP to have a checkup. And on one visit to the GP, the doctor told the parents that there was a breakthrough and there was uh, a procedure, very simple, not very uh, uh, disruptive to the boy's education, not painful, and it was going to uh, restore hearing in 10% of cases. And the doctor asked them, you know, parents, do you want to give this a try? You know, one in 10 chance, you know, the government will pay for it. And um, it's uh, not really uh, painful. And so the parents said, yeah, okay, why not? And so they gave this, their child this procedure and it worked. His sound, was, his um, hearing was restored. And at that point, the young boy got very angry at his parents. Why didn't you ask me? He said, now I am afflicted by this noise constantly in my ears. I never wanted to hear. I was quite happy just having four senses. If you wanted to give me anything, give me another hand, he said, so I could feel the world. That was much richer than this noise always going on. Or give me another eye, because at least I can close my eyes. But we don't, we have eyelids, we don't have earlids. It'd be wonderful if we had earlids every now and again. So when somebody was snoring, we could sort of stop them. <laughs> somebody sh showed me a book once, and they please don't take offence at this. But there was this fellow who was partially deaf in one ear, and his doctor, I don't know how this happened, he had a pea stuck down his ear hole, a dried pea. And so the doctor's simple procedure, and it hurt a little bit, removed the pee, so he could hear again. And so the next week he went back to the doctor and said, can you please put it back in again? <coughs> now I can hear my wife. <laughs> sometimes we always think that having an extra sense is a wonderful thing. And that's an assumption. And for many people, I give them their choice, but they should make the call, not us. This boy, he was upset, they never asked him. He wasn't aware of the conversation, because he couldn't hear it. So anyway, sometimes we think that having sensory experience is a wonderful thing. When you get into deep meditation, you can't feel the body, you can't see, you can't hear, smell, or have any taste. Your senses are being removed. Check it out. That's pretty blissful.
So when it says the experience, especially first of five senses of suffering, mm-hmm. actually there's something to that. So the, <coughs> the next step of the mindfulness of the chitta, the mind. How are you mindful of the mind? Now notice it actually changes a little bit here. When you feel a pleasant experience, you're mindful that you feel a pleasant experience. In this one, it doesn't say you're mindful, that you understand, you know. So it's not mindful that the mind is affected by wanting, you know the mind is affected by wanting. You understand a mind is affected by wanting as such, and a mind that is unaffected by wanting as such. You understand a mind that is affected by aversion as such, and a mind that is unaffected by aversion as such. You understand a mind that is affected by delusion as such, and a mind that is unaffected by delusion as such. Hang on. How can you understand the deluded mind? If you're deluded, it means you don't understand. And this answers a question which was in the, uh, the question box some time ago. If you are supposed to have abandoned the five hindrances, or at least restrained them, as a prerequisite to doing these Satipatthana, isn't that a, a contradiction? How is it that you have to abandon the five hindrances and then you, you are aware of the five hindrances? You're not aware of the five hindrances, you understand them, and especially by recalling what they were like, their causes, where they come from, and how to overcome them. This is actually what the Buddha says, it's quite clear in the suttas and also in the commentaries of the Satipatthana suttas, and it is valid. So as such, sometimes this cannot be true, you think, what the Buddha says. But look again, it's not that the Buddha's making a mistake, making a mistake, it's something, you, you miss something. So, mindful of the Jutta, you understand the mind is affected by aversion, uh, delusion, or um, wanting. You understand the contracted mind is contracted, a distracted mind is distracted. And this is a, a wonderful little uh, addition, because the contracted mind is because of dullness and drowsiness. The metaphor is, if you're dull and drowsy and sleepy, your mind is small. It cannot sort of expand to see wide things. They say it sometimes it's like you are uh, <coughs> uh, even up in the prison. You can't sort of... Uh, uh, actually, that's the, uh, the prison simile is sort of um, the distracted mind. It's like you're really, really dull in a mist. And distracted is distracted because of restlessness and remorse. The fourth hindrance, restlessness and remorse. Again, another interesting addition to the fourth hindrance, remorse. It's when you think about what you've done in the past and you haven't forgiven yourself yet. You haven't let it go, which means it's keeping on distracting you. When you're meditating, you should be nice and peaceful, but you think, oh, maybe I should do something about uh, reconciling or making amends for the terrible things which I've done in the past. But this is not what we do in Buddhism. We don't have punishment. And we don't encourage remorse. Instead, we have what... Uh, people in Australia understand this uh, acronym, the AFL code, because that's Australian Football League code. And AFL means acknowledge, make sure you are honest about any mistakes, forgive, immediately. You made a mistake, big deal, everyone makes mistakes. And then learn, but no punishment. Number one, fear of punishment, being found out and being humiliated, or even worse, means that you hide the truth. People lie because of fear of being found out and the consequences. So an example, just to lighten things up a bit, 
the, a young man, an Anagarika, a Bodhinyana monastery, many years ago, Anagarika, and they're training to be a monk. He came to see me early one morning and he said, I haven't slept all night. Why? Because I did something terrible. I broke an important precept. I know you're going to throw me out or worse. I said, what do you do? Who did you kill? <laughs> yeah, sometimes I don't take things seriously. If I want to light things up. That's my nature. But anyway, he said, no, no, no. Last night I was hungry and I snuck into the kitchen and I saw there was some bread and some spreads and forget what else he did, I made myself a sandwich. I made myself a sandwich in the middle of the night and worse, I ate it! <laughs> I'm a terrible person! I know sometimes people are so hard on themselves it's only a sandwich, you know, you didn't sort of um, kill anybody or have sex or do you know, weird and strange things. You didn't sort of rob the donation box. You know, it's only a sandwich. But he thought it was the end of the world for him. I said, no, listen, first of all, you know, instead of having to do things like that, eat more at lunchtime, fill your plate up a bit more. And in the evening, as you all know by now, all the allowables you can eat, under eight precepts, cheese, chocolate, honey, you can make a whole meal if you really want to. <laughs> <coughs> so you know, have some more of that. So you can go now. And that's when he stopped and said, Ashan Brown, aren't you going to punish me? So you know we don't do punishment, you acknowledge. Now you forgive yourself, you learn to do better next time. I just helped you with how you don't need to feel hungry in the evening. So that's on brown, that's not good enough. He said, you have to give me punishment. Because that's how I was brought up. And I know if you don't punish me, I will do it again. <laughs> now people are like that. So that's when I had to think quickly. What's an appropriate punishment for this Australian guy? And then I recalled that even that morning I was reading a book about Australian history, about the convicts who were transported you know, to Australia and how they were very cruelly treated. And if they made any mistake, broke any law, any infringement, they were brutally flogged with a cat of nine tails. And I've just been reading just how wicked and uh, gross that was. But I was in my mind. So I said, OK, you want a punishment, a traditional Australian punishment. I was just reading about your Australian. I will give you 50 strokes of the cat. <laughs> and you should have seen this young man's face, drain of all colour. His lips started to quiver. You know, he really thought I was going to flog him. <laughs> Just shows how little people know about Buddhism. But anyway, he was really scared. He said, that's not the sort of punishment I wanted. And he said, 50 strokes, you asked for it, 50 strokes of the cat. And as he was quivering in fear, I said, in this monastery, 50 strokes of the cat mean this. At that time we had two cats. <laughs> Find either one of them and stroke them. One, two. Put them on your lap, it's nice and stroke them. One, 50 times to learn some compassion <laughs> and kindness. Eventually you got it. Why do we want to punish ourselves? Have remorse guilt. Why? Because we have not enough kindness. So that's one of the reasons why. Find a cat and stroke it. You may notice in the back there on a very high seat is a teddy bear. If you come to, that's very good, I can notice his jacket there. It came from Hong Kong originally, that one. 
Uh, having a teddy bear, those of you who've seen you know, the Bear Awareness book, B A R Awareness, no why. I've got a teddy bear there as well. So if anyone's done anything naughty, they can borrow this teddy bear and hug it 50 times. That's your punishment. <laughs> Learn some kindness and softness. Then that overcomes remorse. But what would be the case if people do it again? They don't. And you're kind to them and respect them. So anyway, so this is where remorse is part of the fourth hindrance. It stops you being still. You're restless. So that's a bit of kindness, a bit of forgiveness. Stops remorse in this track. Anyway, <coughs> already, already finished. Yeah, I should be mindful of time and clocks near the chitta. <laughs> yeah, so you understand an exalted mind, a surpassed mind, a still mind, and a liberated mind, all referring to a mind in jhana as such and the opposite as such. In this way, you're aware of your own chitta, the mind, uh, other people's minds, the mind of both. And you understand what causes your rising of the mind, and it's nama rupa, just the objects. You're aware that the mind is the nature to cease. <coughs> You're aware of the jitta's causal nature of both arising and ceasing. Well, so my friend, it's just this a jitta, impermanent suffering, not me, not mine, not a permanent essence. It's established in you to the extent necessary for my and wisdom, essential to liberation. Your body is independent of clinging to anything in the world. When it comes to, I'll go quickly through this because I'm going to reinforce this afterwards when we have the uh, Anapana Sati as a way of practicing the four Sati Patana as well as Anapana Sati. And it, it's called Nirvana through Anapana Sati in a couple of ages' time. But when it says mindful of the mind objects, the first two are the five hindrances <coughs> and the seven enlightenment factors. And it was pointed out by uh, many really good scholars, people like Bhikkhu Analia, that the earliest versions of the Satipatthana Sutta, because there's been many versions, many manuscripts detailing the, the Satipatthana Sutta, the very earliest ones and the ones which were taken to places like China and translated, only have the five hindrances and the seven enlightenment factors under the fourth Satipatthana. That was the original, earliest version of Satipatthana. The five hindrances, because that's what's stopping you becoming enlightened. And the enlightenment factors is what happens when those five hindrances get suppressed. So that's why they had those. And I'll just very quickly, what is that time? It's five. five. Just five. five. Okay, so just, it's interesting here with the similes for the five hindrances. Suppose you took out a loan and your business was successful, then you repaid, this is on page 44, you repaid the loan and there was enough left over for your own enjoyment and for that of your family. As a result, you'd be glad and full of joy. The taking out a loan is, a synod, is the simile for wanting. You're borrowing something, hoping to get something in the future. You're literally borrowing happiness and energy. And when you have to pay it back, it's always with interest. So if you're happy with what you have, you find that you have much more happiness. Ill will is like an illness. Suppose you were very ill, you couldn't eat or sleep, had no strength. Later, however, you recovered, could eat and sleep again, you regained your strength, which resulted in regret and full of joy. The ill will is like the mental illness of being angry. It doesn't help anybody, but when that ill will has disappeared, and that ill will can lead to yourself, to your own actions of the past, or ill will to others, or even this amazing the ill will to a computer. <laughs> Stupid computer, you crashed again! I've seen people shouting at computers, shouting at their car. Does anybody <coughs> remember Forty Towers? 
<laughs> Do you remember that scene when Basil fought his car broke down? At the most inconvenient moment. So Basil fought it. He got a, a couple of uh, twigs and he beat that car. He caned it. He thrashed it. <laughs> yeah, I told you, I warned you, car. Whack, whack, whack. I warned you. He had it coming to you. Whack. <laughs> yeah, sure, the car can feel that. Sure, that's going to help. But that's sometimes what we do. We get angry at things which have done nothing wrong. It's not their fault. They're just a, a machine. Why do we get angry at them? Why do you get angry at husbands, wives, kids, politicians? Politicians are just being politicians. What do you expect? And getting angry at them, does that help? Anyway, we found out. Suppose you were imprisoned and later were released. Safe and full of joy. Uh, safe and secure, with no loss to your property, as a result you'd be glad and full of joy. And that is the simile, uh, that was correct there, the stock and talker. Or suppose you're a slave dependent upon others, unable to go where you want. Then later you will release from slavery, independent of others, able to go wherever you want, as a result you'll be glad and full of joy. That's restlessness and remorse. You just want to be with your breath, you want to just sit here, but you're not free. Your will tells you, go here, go there, do something else. You're not good enough, improve. Restlessness is like being a slave. Or suppose you had to travel along a dangerous road across the wilderness, but later you would pass through that wilderness safe and secure, with no loss to your property, and as a result you'd be glad and full of joy. And I gave a simile of the, um, the mit being lost in the mist. But because we run out of time, I'll just finish off with another simile I have for being lost in the desert. And that was the gentleman who was lost in the desert for days, you know, over in Australia. And it was really, really hot. The sun was beating down. And he was crawling. He hadn't had any liquids for a long time. He was dehydrated, sunstroke, heat stroke, probably both at the same time. And he was crawling, not realizing there's no, he's going to probably die soon. There's no way he can find any water. If he doesn't get rescued quickly, he'll be dead. And he, but he kept on crawling just for his life. And then he saw in the distance, you know, in the very hot desert, you see things shimmering on the horizon there was a, a strange shimmer on the horizon, not like anywhere else, like something was coming towards him. And so he gathered all his strength and looked, and it was, it looked like there was something coming. And he thought, no, this is probably a mirage, because mirages do happen, and especially when the sun was beating on his brain, and almost frying it, and he thought, no, it's just, I'm hallucinating. And he was pretty sure he was hallucinating when it came closer, and to all intents and purposes, it looked like a dog sled with six husky dogs pulling a sleigh. And on the sleigh, it looked like there was an Inuit, uh, what we used to call Eskimos, in furs in the middle of the desert. And he thought, I'm really gone crazy now. This is death for sure. And as it came closer, he could hear the husky dogs barking. And he thought, is this real? And as it came right up to him, the husky dog started licking him. You could feel their tongues. It was real. He'd been rescued by a slave, uh, pulled by husky dogs with an Inuit, an Eskimo, in furs. And he just burst out. He was drinking some water from the, the Inuit. He said, oh, I thought I was lost. I've been in the desert for days. I was almost dead. I was really lost. And the Inuit looked at him and said, and you think you're lost? <laughs> <laughs> That's just a joke. Then <laughs> <laughs> this super class, the origin of Vipassana class, 
and uh, some other stuff class. Okay, so. Sa. So.